Welcome everyone, this is the open session. Uh, thank you for coming. So Anna is in her final year of a PhD in health economics at the University of Manchester funded by Wellcome. And the PhD is evaluating the effectiveness of community approaches at protecting and improving health and well-being and reducing inequalities. This paper is evaluating the health and well-being returns of social participation and the role of community asset infrastructure. So fire away. Okay, perfect. Hi. Well, so yeah, that was a really nice introduction. Thank you. So I'll just go straight into the theory behind like what is social participation. So, oh, I'm not done Zoom in ages. There we go. So social participation, it comes under the umbrella of social capital. Um, and this social capital from the Putnam de definition, um, it's to do with connections with others that enrich people's lives. And these connections have two parts, which is the tangible part, which is the membership of community groups, which leads into the social participation and the intangible part, which is the community trust element. So we focus predominantly on this um, social participation as something we can measure. But there's another concept that builds into um, both these, which is asset mapping. So this is to do with um, identifying things within the community that can enable people to engage in social participation, social capital, and it helps build community trust. So these can be physical spaces such as parks, um, leisure centers, youth clubs, or institutions like schools, universities, associations such as the groups, or individuals who have knowledge and skills with, to engage, to run these sort of groups. And additionally, local economies, such as um, there's local budgets that put direct money into like museums and community groups. So the introduction of why we um, investigate why this is an interesting topic. So social capital has been shown to broadly improve um, health outcomes. This is found in a recent systematic review. However, there's been um, issues with working out what part of social capital um, contributes most to health. Could this be the tangible part, which is the community groups or the intangible part, which is this part of community trust? And there's, in, there's issues of which one contributes more. Social participation has led to improved health outcomes and additionally reduced mortality. So there's, there's important associations with individuals outcome, but there are endogeneity concerns around social participation such as reverse causality, those with better health, more likely to engage in social participation, but social participation is linked to better health, improving health, and also this selection bias. Additionally, access to these community assets facilitates social participation, especially those community assets that are um, cl close in proximity and people can walk to them. So we aim to estimate what the health and well-being returns to social participation. And also if these effects vary by um, probability of participating, because we found that there's um, different socioeconomic status and um, is a predictor of social participation. So the data that we use for this, um, we use the UK Household Longitudinal Study, and we've got the special license for this which means the LSOA special line. So that's a certain level of geography that we have, that we can identify the individuals within the survey. And we measure social participation from the social and interest group membership component. So people are asked within the survey, I'm going to, um, about what types of organizations they're part of. And here are the types of groups that they can list that they're a member of. And we use this as our social participation indicator. So if anyone, answers yes to any of those groups, then we um, mark them as someone who engages in social participation. And if they say no, then they are not. So then the outcomes that we look at, so we have the health and wellbeing. So for the health, we just use the general self-assessed health score, which we reverse code it such that poor is now one and um, excellent health is five. And then for wellbeing, we use the SF12 mental health component. And this is derived from six questions using a like, six point like point scale. So the questions that people, these questions are about mental health, if they accomplish less, um, make them work less carefully, whether they felt calm and peaceful, how much energy that they had, and whether they felt depressed, and also if this um, mental health interfered with social interactions. Then this scale, and then from this, that's basically turned into a score from zero to 100 with a mean of 50, and then it's given a standard deviation of 10. 
So this our model, as I mentioned before, we had some endogeneity concerns. So we had social participation on either health or well-being. We had issues of reverse causality. So this reverse causality. So this um, led to the idea of using an instrument variable. And as we said before, community assets were found um, to be a good predictor of social participation. The community assets data that we collect is on community centres, sports centres, places of worship, youth clubs, and assets of community value. And we use um, an indicator if they're within one kilometre of uh, an individual's LSOA centroid. Just a quick note on these assets of community value. These are, um, these are special ones that individuals um, nominate within their community uh, with their local authority, and they have special um, Look like protection and um, that they can't be disposed of and the individuals want to keep them that in their community. Of these five community assets, we have to geocode this data. So we have to get their coordinates of all of these data points. Some of them were like, easy to get, some of them involved Googling, which was quite time consuming. But that's why um, we focused our findings just on Greater Manchester, because it allowed us to have a good an urban area of, of the UK, but also meant it wasn't too time consuming getting all the data. So for an example, for the community centres, how we calculated um, whether an individual had them within that area, this, we use this example within Stockport. So the person's house is in the middle, and as you can see, there's um, a community centre here, 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 and here. So basically, we use a program, a statistical program that then calculates which one's the closest, which will be this one, and then whether, and then afterwards, we then see if that's within one kilometre radius of the individual's LSOA centroid. And we do this across the five um, assets, um, community assets. Um, so the next part, the methods that we use to answer this, we use a marginal treatment effects model, as this allows us to both use an instrument variable specification, but also allows us to estimate the treatment effects across probability of treated. So we can estimate um, the treatment effects of someone with a high probability of attending, participating in social, participating in social participation, that's a lot of words, or compared to low probability. So the first stage we model um, social participation, which is a, contains our assets, whether they're within one kilometer of someone's LSOA centroid, and a range of controls, which include at individual level, household level, and area level. Just And then from that first stage, we use the first stage estimates in the second stage to estimate the effects on the outcomes. And we use the same set of individual, household, and area level controls there. And then the final stage, we estimate these treatment effects across the propensity scores from the first stage. It's slightly more complicated than a traditional instrument variable model, but it's because we're able to see if there's heterogeneous effects across the participation levels rather than just looking at the average person in the middle, we opted for this. So additionally, we can estimate the average treatment effect, the average treatment effect on treated, so those with high probability of attending, and on and then average treatment on average treatment effect on untreated, which is the low probability, and then the local average treatment effects, which is the compliers, which is a traditional IV model. So these are the results. These are um, column one refers to the summary statistics, and then column two is the first stage results for the model. So for youth clubs um, within Greater Manchester, 54.3% of the individuals had a youth centre within one kilometre of their house, or less sorry, centroid, and um, they had a 46.7% had an asset of community value within one kilometre of their house. So the second column refers to um, the average marginal effects on social participation. So here, um, those individuals who had a youth cl club within one kilometre of their house, they were 6.3 percentage points more likely to engage in social participation than those who did not. So similarly, um, for assets of community value, whereas the rest, um, they either had counterintuitive um, effects or they weren't significant. So these are the um, results. So the graph here is the marginal treatment effects graph. So on the um, on the bottom axis, it's, it's unobserved resistance to treatment. But the easiest way to see it is on the right hand side. It's the lower probability of part social 
participation and the left hand side is the high probability of social participation. So the treatment effects are then plotted across um, each like quintile at the bottom. So those with high probability of engaging in social participation had positive and um, significant returns to their health with the average treatment untreated effect showing a 2.2 increase in self assessed health. And then for well-being, we find a similar trend with those of high probability of engaging in social participation, having positive significant returns to their health, whereas low probability showing negative effects. Similarly, the average treatment effects untreated showed a 20 increase in the well-being score compared to non-participants. So what we find is that community asset infrastructure is a strong predictor of social participation, particularly the youth clubs and the assets of community value. And there are significant returns to those who are more likely to engage in social participation. However, this result actually could lead to widening, existing, widening of existing health inequalities. This is because we find that those of higher socioeconomic status are more likely to engage. So this, those people already have um, better health outcomes. So in order to have equitable health, health gains, then we should be empowering individuals of low social participation rates, such as those of low socioeconomic status, to engage with um, these policies of nominating, nominating these assets to community values. And this is one way that um, health inequalities could be addressed. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Anna. It's really interesting. Um, a really nice example of using the um, LSOA as well data, so the special license data. I'm sure you've got stories about accessing that data as well. As well. So Nicole Andalik is a research fellow in the economics department at the University of Aberdeen. Prior to this position, she held a fellowship at Queen's University Belfast, where she also received her PhD in psychology. In her current role, she's working on a project examining health and variable payment contracts. Her, her interests include financial decision making, debt advice and stress. Oh, I'm sure you can help us all out. <laughs> Over to you, Nicole. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And I should apologize in advance as well if your um, live transcript goes haywire here, because I'm not sure you can manage my accent, but um, I'll do my best to speak clearly. So um, yes, I have a quite an interdisciplinary background and the team that I'm representing today is very interdisciplinary as well. So we have Keith Bender and Yanis Theodosio, who are both in the economics department at the University of Aberdeen, and Julia Allen and Daniel Powell, who are in the health psychology group, also at the University of Aberdeen. And so I want to talk today about an empirical analysis from a larger ESRC grant on performance related pay. And um, performance rated pay or PRP is when your payment contract depends on your performance or your output. So um, in its most straightforward sense, you can maybe think of the delivery drivers if you're ordering food and they can choose to be paid by PRP. So that means that they get paid per delivery that they make. But there's also um, jobs where maybe you're paid partial PRP. So you have a portion of your salary, which is fixed and then a portion of your salary, uh, which varies depending on your performance. So commission-based um, jobs or um, a lot of jobs in finance, for example, are partial PRP. And because this um, kind of, the, the prevalence of PRP differs depending on exactly which definition of PRP you use. Um, it means that it could be between 10 to 40% of workers in Europe or the US, but I hope I've kind of convinced you that there's a significant portion of the population who are employed on these contracts. Um, traditionally, um, employers kind of like these contracts because they're associated with higher productivity um, and also higher earnings for the employee. But actually in the past two decades or so, um, there's been an emerging literature which has found kind of an association between people on PRP and also poor health outcomes. And so if you think about these health outcomes, there seems to be roughly three different pathways uh, in which this could happen. So the first pathway is very simple. And um, people on PRP contracts are more likely to get into um, accidents and injuries. So um, truckers, for example, who are paid by PRP are more, are more likely to have accidents. 
And you can think of it, um, if you think about the delivery driver again, um, if you are incentivized to work harder or work faster, then you might be likely to cut corners and um, maybe hurry so that you can make that next delivery. And then um, you might be likely to put yourself at risk as well. But we see this across a wide range of industries. The second pathway is that if you're working in PRP and you're um, trying to prove to um, work harder or work longer hours, then you might have a trade-off between working harder and um, healthy activities during your leisure time. So you might have less time for um, physical activity, for example, or cooking, um, and you might be more likely to engage in activities such as um, drinking alcohol and drug use as kind of a coping mechanism um, for dealing with the kind of hard work during your working hours. And then finally, a uh, third pathway is simply that PRP is um, inherently more stressful than fixed pay. So we know that if you're working in PRP, then you're more likely to have a higher variable income stream, which is considered more stressful. And although we're very good as humans at bouncing back from kind of brief episodes of stress, um, if we're suffering with long-term stress, and then that can eventually compromise the immune system and make us more susceptible to these other conditions that I've listed here. Um, of course, um, there are some gaps in the current literature. And so one of those gaps is that the people who work in PRP are um, a self-selected sample. So people who choose to uh, work in PRP jobs might have specific unobservable characteristics, which also affect their health. OK, so maybe it's that people who work in PRP are just more tolerant of risk. And if you're more tolerant of risk, um, then maybe you're also more likely to engage in healthy behavior or unhealthy behavior, um, which is risky to your health and leads to poor health outcomes. So that's that's one issue. The second issue is that really a lot of this um, data has looked at self-reported measures of health um, and there is a lack of physiological measures of health. And so it's possible that if you're struggling with your mental health already, which some of these people in PRP seem to do, then you might also be more likely to rate your physical health as worse. And we did actually run a, an experiment where we examined the difference between um, PRP and uh, fixed uh, groups. And we found that those in PRP have higher levels of cortisol. Um, but of course, it's an experiment. So it was a very small homogenous group. and um, of course, we could only look at cortisol um, after acute stress, so we don't really know anything about the chronic stress. So in the current paper, what we wanted to do was to address these issues by, um, first of all, statistically correcting for some of the self-selection um, by using instruments. And um, secondly, we wanted to look at biological health markers as well as self-reported health, just to get a slightly fuller picture. Uh, we used data from wave two of the UKHLS. So um, what's really good about the UKHLS is that they include an item about PRP, although only in every other wave. And in wave two and three, they also include a nurse assessment, which has this biological health data. Um, so because of that, we were able to use wave two because it included both the PRP measure and the nurse assessment. Um, although, of course, only um, on a kind of subset of the sample. So I've shown a graph here, which kind of shows how we go from a relatively large sample into a much smaller sample using our analysis. And um, we only used those who were, um, said that they were employees. So nobody who is self-employed or um, studying or retired. And we only used those who are between 18 and 65. So the kind of typical labor force and only those who completed the nurse assessment module. Now, within that group, um, there's kind of different estimates or there's differences between the sample that completed the self-report data and then slightly fewer people completed the blood pressure data or gave their blood pressure. And even fewer people um, gave blood so that we have blood marker data for them. So in order to kind of maximize the sample that we have for these different groups of measures that we're interested in, um, we split them into three different samples. So the samples overlap. Uh, very much so, but they are slightly, slightly different just because we wanted to have as many respondents as possible for each of the health measures. And um, we have a range of health variables. So first of all, we have four measures of self-reported health, which I've all coded so that higher values here indicate better health. We have the GHQ, um, which is a general mental health over the past four weeks. Uh, we included one item where people rate their um, general health from one to five. And then we have the two um, 
the two components of SF12. So the physical component summary and the mental component summary, which really are quality of life measures, which look at how much your everyday is uh, everyday activity is limited due to your physical health or due to your mental health. And then we have um, the two groups of biological variables. So we have blood pressure, which includes systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure. And then we created a binary variable where we um, predicted the probability that you would be above the clinical cutoff for high blood pressure. And um, we also have um, two inflammatory markers uh, from, the, from the blood samples. So um, we have C-reactive protein and fibrinogen, uh, both of which indicate worse health if they are high or more inflammation. Um, and they're both, they're both associated with kind of acute stress as well as chronic stress. Okay, so I just thought this was quite interesting. If we only look at very simple comparisons of um, the PRP group and the fixed salary employees, um, and we just compare them on these various health measures, what we actually see is that the people um, in the PRP group have better self-reported general health, um, physical health, C-reactive protein and fibrinogen. Um, so all of which suggesting that actually they are healthier than, um, than the fixed salary sample. And you might think that this seems like the complete opposite of everything I've said so far, and you would be right. It's very um, different to the literature that we've already spoken about. And there are a couple of reasons for that. So first of all, the PRP sample are likely to be um, much younger. They are likely to be higher educated and they're likely to earn more, all of which are also associated with health. So um, that tells us that it's really important to control for these things in regressions when we run these analyses. And then finally, we also have this issue with self-selection. And previously I talked about risk tolerance, but we have self-selection the other way as well, which is that if you have a propensity to poor health, then you're probably less likely to work in a PRP job where your output um, determines your income. So what we did is we ran endogenous treatment models where we estimated a regression for each health outcome. And then we included these um, instruments which predict selecting into PRP, but that shouldn't predict the health outcome in question. So um, we included covariates such as income, uh, whether they worked in a manual or non-manual work, um, occupation category, age, gender, education level, marital status, ethnicity, hours work per week, and country of residence in the UK. And then we also included a couple of health covariates. So we included BMI, whether they had ever been a smoker, and also for the biological markers, we included taking prescribed medication because some medications can affect both your blood pressure and um, these markers in the blood. And then finally, we have the two instruments. So the two instruments are firm size as well as a um, percentage share of PRP workers in the occupation that you work in. And so firm size um, predicts uh, working in a PRP job because larger firms are more likely to use PRP. But there's no reason for why firm size should predict your health in the UK anyway. And then um, percentage of share of PRP workers in your occupation. If you work in an occupation where it's very common to have um, PRP contracts, then you are more likely to work in PRP. But, the, um, but this percentage share shouldn't affect your, um, your health outcome. And so we tested this as well in regressions. And indeed, we found that they do. They are significant predictors of PRP, but they are not significant predictors of health once you control for PRP. OK, so um, what I've done here is I've only shown you the marginal effect of working in PRP on the health outcomes. I haven't shown you any of the covariates because we would be here all day if that was the case. And I've also included the kind of means for the overall sample below so that you can get an idea of what effect size this is um, on, the, on the means. So you can see, for example, that the mean um, GHQ12 is 25 out of a possible 36, but the PRP group are likely to um, have 6.9 units less than the fixed salary group. So quite a, quite a big effect, really. And what we see here is that PRP is a significant predictor of um, worse general health and um, worse self-reported mental health. They have higher systolic blood pressure and higher levels of fibrinogen. Um, so it's not that we see a significant effect of PRP across the board, but we do see it on a range of variables which are uh, connected to chronic stress. Interestingly, we also see that it predicts less activity limitation due to physical health. So um, there's no apparent reasons for why that would be, um, but it is possible that our sample is doesn't really contain any people with severe mobility issues, 
Um, and it might also be that this is um, something, you know, severe impacts on your health. It wouldn't be seen until you've worked in PRP for a very long time. And so maybe our sample doesn't capture that. What we did see also was that there were several covariates which predict um, these health outcomes. And that includes gender as well as um, whether you work in manual or non-manual employment. So what we decided to do was just to look at the same regressions, but within these specific subsamples, just to dig a little bit deeper there. And what we can see here is that although there's um, plenty of results which are very similar across the different subsamples, there are a few differences. So we see that um, the effect of PRP leading to um, better activity limitation due to physical health seems to actually be driven by male workers. Um, and also we can see that male workers have, um, that is a sample where we see the impact of PRP on higher C-reactive protein and fibrinogen. Um, whereas actually, if we look at the female sample or the non-manual sample, um, we see that they have slightly lower levels of C-reactive protein. And again, um, we weren't sure why we see these results and I'm very happy to hear any suggestions that you might have. Um, one thing is that we do predict or we do control for how many hours they work, but we don't have any information about kind of their shift schedules or anything like that. And so it might be that working in PRP allows for some flexibility, um, which is very much appreciated in certain subsamples. We know from other studies that women uh, might appreciate flexibility in the workplace more due to other factors. And so maybe that cancels out some of the effect of PRP on health. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we have some evidence for PRP workers um, suffering from worse mental health and biomarkers, and specifically when we look at those related to chronic stress. Um, we do see some affections as well. Um, male workers seem to have better quality of life regarding physical health, and we see some of the opposite effects in specifically female and non-manual worker samples. There are some limitations to our study, so we only have a very broad measure of PRP and we don't know whether they're working in full PRP or in partial PRP, and we would expect to see different effects. So people who are working in full PRP um, we are likely to be more stressed and, and we can't tease that apart. And we also don't have any information about risk preference or personality traits, although we do include um, smoking as kind of a proxy for risk. Um, and we do think that self-selection should control for some of that. However, uh, we do think that we have some results that suggest that using PRP contracts can have um, a detrimental effect on the employed population. And uh, this is something that employers should take notice of because even though PRP leads to higher productivity, we also know that um, work-related stress leads to high absences in the workplace. So this might actually can cancel out that positive effect for employers. Okay, thank you very much. I've included a link here to our website if you would like to read more about our um, project. And I'm very happy to take any questions if there are any. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. And we'll move on to our final speaker, who is Mel de Lang. Do you want to share your presentation, Mel? And I will introduce you. So Mel de Lang is a Wellcome Trust funded PhD student in the MRC Inter Integrative Epidemiology Unit at the University of Bristol. She has a Master's of Research in Health and Wellbeing from Bristol University. Mel's current PhD research looks at the effects of the spring and autumn clock changes on cardiovascular outcomes and depressive symptoms in the UK. Her wider research interests include exploring the effects of modifiable risk factors for disease such as sleep, nutrition and physical activity. Sounds all sounds fascinating. So over to you, Mel. OK, hello, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about some research that I did for my master's dissertation, which looked at the time windows that people eat within each day and whether this is related to metabolic health. So research is increasingly showing that when we eat, in addition to what and how much we eat, is important for our weight and health. Time-restricted eating is a form of fasting that involves limiting food take to a certain time period each day, usually 12 hours or less, without changing the quantity or quality of your diet. In general, fasting is believed to be beneficial for health because it causes the body to switch from burning glucose to burning fat for energy and gives the body time to rest and repair itself. In addition, time restricted eating is thought to be beneficial for metabolic health because it works with the body's own natural circadian rhythm. 
Animal studies strongly suggest that time-restricted eating is beneficial for metabolic health. However, the evidence from human studies is less convincing. So, for example, studies of Ramadan fasting suggest that time-restricted eating is beneficial for healthy individuals, but not necessarily other subgroups. Meanwhile, small-scale clinical trials suggest that whilst adherence to time-restricted regimes is high, they offer little metabolic benefit over normal eating patterns. Other researchers looked at what eating windows people naturally eat within in the real world. Um, by daily eating window, we mean the time between when somebody first starts eating or drinking in the morning and when they finish eating or drinking in the evening. And studies have shown that generally most people eat for a period of over 12 hours a day, so could potentially benefit from time restricted eating. However, the number of studies conducted is small and it's difficult to generalise the results because of small sample sizes. In addition, there's been little research looking at the link between daily eating window and metabolic health, and there's been little research done in the UK. This means that the true potential of time restricted eating to improve the metabolic health of UK adults is unclear. So the aim of this research was to evaluate the potential use of time restricted eating as a dietary intervention to improve the metabolic health of UK adults. More specifically, we wanted to use a large representative sample of UK adults to identify what length of daily eating window people eat within in the UK. We wanted to identify the socio-demographics and health behaviours of those with a longer daily eating window. And we also wanted to explore whether there's a relationship between metabolic health and length of daily eating window. And then finally, we wanted to formulate recommendations as to whether time restricted eating could be used to improve the health of UK adults. And if so, what daily eating window could be feasible. To do this, we conducted a secondary data analysis of the UK National Diet and Nutrition Survey. The NDNS is a cross-sectional survey conducted every year to examine the nutritional intake and eating habits of the UK population aged one and a half and over. It collects data from a representative sample of the UK population. Data collection takes place in two different stages. In stage one, participants are visited by an interviewer. They complete a computer assisted personal interview. They have their height and weight measured. They complete a physical activity questionnaire and they complete a four day food diary, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. For those who complete three or four days of the food diary are then visited by a nurse. They have their fasting blood sample taken their waist and hip measurements are taken, and their blood pressure is measured. This is an example of the food diary used in the NDNS. So as you can see, as well as information on what people are eating, there's information on the time of each eating occasion in hours and minutes. So participants are asked to continue their normal eating habits and record the information as they go along rather than relying on memory. And they complete the diaries on three or four continuous days with the start day randomised to ensure a representation of all days of the week. In our study, we included all participants who taken part in any of the years one to nine of the NDNS. We only included adults aged 19 or over who had completed three or four days of the food diaries. This gave us a total sample of 6,802 participants. Of those, around three quarters were visited by the nurse and just over half provided a blood sample. Our exposure variables were our measures of metabolic health, so BMI, waist hip ratio, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, cholesterol, triglycerides, C-reactive protein, HbA1c and glucose concentrations. We had length of daily eating window as the outcome variable because we wanted to understand the associations in the context of how much daily eating windows change. We also included a variety of socio-demographic and health behaviour variables in our analyses. So 
age, gender, ethnicity, um, employment, education, and also um, behavior variables like physical activity, sleep, smoking, and alcohol consumption. In terms of data analysis, it's worth noting that the NDNS data are fully anonymized and they are weighted for selection and non-response bias at each stage of the data collection process. In terms of statistical analysis, we conducted a simple linear regression analysis to examine the relationship between sociodemographics and health behaviours and length of daily eating window. And then we conducted a multiple linear regression analysis adjusting for confounders to look at the relationship between metabolic health and length of daily eating window. Moving on to our results. In our study, the mean daily eating window was 13 hours and 33 minutes, and 78% of participants had a daily eating window of over 12 hours. Our simple linear regression analysis showed a number of characteristics associated with having a longer daily eating window. These included being older, white and male, being degree educated, being employed, not smoking, having a higher calorie intake, having a higher proportion of your calories coming from sugar, getting less sleep, being more physically active, drinking alcohol more frequently, and having a higher fruit and vegetable intake. Our multiple linear regression analysis showed that after adjusting for confounders, BMI or waist hip ratio and LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol, were negatively associated with length of daily eating window. And we also found that HDL cholesterol, the cholesterol was positively associated with length of daily eating window. So these results were the opposite of what we expected um, because they suggest that worse metabolic health is associated with a shorter daily eating window. Um, but in keeping with what we did expect, CRP, which is a measure of inflammation, was positively associated with the length of daily eating window. It's worth noting here that the effect sizes for the metabolic markers we found were too small to be meaningful in the real world. And also we found no association between daily eating window and our other measures of metabolic health. So um, HbA1c, glucose, blood pressure, and triglycerides. The strengths of this study include the large nationally re representative sample, as well as the wide variety of nutrition, health, and socioeconomic variables available in the NDNS. The limitations include the fact that people tend to underreport in food diaries, um, so they may accidentally or deliberately forget that glass of wine or snack that they had before bed, and so their actual daily eating window may be longer than that recorded. Also, participants only recorded one time point for each eating occasion, not a start and a finish time. Um, so again, their actual daily eating window may be different from what they report. The cross-sectional design of the study means that we only have a snapshot of people's eating patterns and metabolic health. Um, it means we only have associations, not causal relationships, because there may be residual confounding. And also having daily eating windows, the outcome variable made it quite difficult to interpret whether the results are clinically meaningful. Um, so it'd be useful to look at the relationship in the other direction. So having daily eating window as the exposure variable, because there are differences in metabolic, metabolic markers, such as weight, that are recognized to be clinically significant. So the results of our study suggest that time-restricted eating could be a feasible intervention for UK adults, because having a daily eating window of 12 hours would only require a short reduction in daily eating window for most people. We also found distinct sociodemographic and health behaviours associated with a longer daily eating window. So these people could be identified and targeted um, by time-restricted eating interventions. However, we found inconsistent associations between metabolic health and daily eating window, and the effect sizes were too small to be meaningful. 
on this basis, it's not possible to recommend time restricted eating to improve the metabolic health of UK adults. Future research in this area could use longitudinal data to look at people's long term eating habits and their long term metabolic health. It would also be useful to look at the timing of the daily eating window kind of earlier in the day versus later in the day and whether this is related to metabolic health. Future studies could also use more objective, accurate and passive measures of food timing, um, as Laura Johnson mentioned this morning. So wrist-worn accelerometers, wearable cameras um, and continuous glucose monitors. Thank you for listening.